Yes, thank you very much for having us. It's a great um, honor for us to be here as the inspiration speech, you can say. Um, and we really hope you do get inspired a little bit by our work. Um, I will shortly introduce ourselves. I'm Nina Gorfer, and this is my partner and friend, Sarah Cooper. And we work together as an artist duo um, for seven years now. Um, let me see here. Yeah. We started to collaborate uh, when we met each other in, in Gothenburg, and we decided to do a book project together. And this is still really, really important in our work, um, the narrative of a book and kind of like the wholeness and how you, how, you, um, how you perceive a book and what it can tell you. So um, all our projects are still always based on books and the idea of a book. So it's always an underlying really great force in our work. From that, we've um, developed you can say our work and our project and approach a little bit. Um, and what's now really, really important, and I think what people perceive us most as, is um, images, our imagery. We work mainly photographically, or you can say our pictures always start with a photograph. And then along the way, which we will show you today also, a lot of things happen. So we're gonna, we're gonna just take you through a little bit where inspiration comes from, comes from, and take you through some of our projects, um, which, as you remember here, it all began with a book. But just to talk a little bit about where we come from and like why do we do what we do? Why do Nina and I collaborate together? What's the force behind it? Uh, I, I was born in Germany, but I grew up in the United States beginning at the age of three in a town called Pittsburgh and it's an old steel town. Um, and in the 80s, it was around the time when they were starting to rip down all of the steel mills. Uh, what I remember as a child were kind of these, um, the carcasses of, these, of the great industry long gone. Uh, my father is an artist, um, and he, the, the image that you see on the right is one of the images that we had in our home. It's gigantic. It's about, uh, I would say, three meters by three meters. It was this world that I could literally fall into. Um, and it was a very typical thing to have around the home, at least in my childhood. And I would say this world that he created um, was a bit of a playground for me, uh, as well as when I first picked up a camera when I was 16 years old and started to investigate these carcasses of what was left in Pittsburgh. And I think this sort of pure fascination with the world around me and my place in it was something just inherent of a young girl trying to find her identity. I grew up in uh, Austria, and uh, as you can see in the pictures behind it, some images from uh, my grandparents, they had a farm in the Austrian Alps, so my upbringing was a little bit less artistic, intellectual than Sarah's. <laughs> um, and, but anyways, what, what, I, what influenced me so much that I came to realize much later on was the storytelling quality that my grandmother had. She was uh, one of the best storytellers I've ever come across, and we've traveled quite a lot right um, up till now. And she could, what's interesting with that more is that, I mean, we all remember, we all kind of probably have this experience as of somebody telling a fantastic story. <clears throat> but what it fascinated me so much was that through her storytelling, I really felt that uh, it was my memory as well. So she kind of, together with this place that was real, she extended my, my how you can say, it, the memory and my perception of uh, what was actually my lived past, which, I, uh, uh, which is, kind of like an, an added up, an extension of your own, of your own real memory. So in, the, in that way, that was really fascinating for me and also how a place, a real place, my grandparents' farm, could grow with personal stories and storytelling. And when me and Sarah met, um, we kind of found this common playground, even though at the time maybe we weren't so really aware of it. But we found the same interest and uh, fascination with old pictures and um, also not only old old pictures but 
but more uh, stories connected to those pictures. So I'm, I'm not sure if you can read that here, but uh, on the, what is it? Right hand side, yeah, it's, my, it's, it's a picture of my family, uh, my grandmother in the tw 1928. Uh, and on the left hand side is a picture of Ferris, Sarah's great grandfather. So we started to really kind of elaborate on that idea of what does that mean and, and why does it inspire us so much. And I think um, the images that we're showing you right now, this is something sort of, I think it's interesting when you go into a project, there are things that you look at maybe before you start going into a project and then there are the things that you discover on the way or afterwards. And I have to say, um, the images that you see here, that's Irving Penn, photographer, and also Edward S. Curtis on the right-hand side. Um, this is someone that, these are, these are two people that we've, you, you could say are is something that now we're looking at. Um, Nina and I went sort of blindly in the beginning with, with complete heart into a project together of analyzation and discovery. Um, what's interesting now looking at Edward S. Curtis, for example, his work, uh, he was photographing in the early 1900s, uh, and he was documenting the Indian tribes one by one. Uh, and he, this was at a time when they were living on the reservations, and a lot of the, the ceremonies uh, that they were sort of indicative of were no longer happening. It was being completely submerged. So he, when he was working with the tribes, he asked them to reenact what they used to do, dress up, you could say. And it was completely criticized at the time by ethnologists, and it was this idea of how much can you recreate history? Where does historical fiction come in? And it's something that I think today is considered a very accurate document, but it's this sort of fine line in the arguments that come around depiction and visualization that is even happening now that is a very interesting subject. And Irving Penn, I mean, completely manipulating the scene, but then not even denying his intention because he's leaving the backdrop, the fashion facade. So these are just more sort of discussions that you could say Nina and I are always looking at as we're furthering in our work as it is a process. So when we started to go for to our pr first project, with, uh, which was uh, we went to Iceland, uh, we took all these interests uh, and tried to create some kind of a method that we could work along. Uh, and we knew it was going to be about storytelling and telling stories and finding out cultural histories and also personal stories from the people we would meet uh, and to photograph them. So we had a travel photo studio with us. And that's about how much we knew at the time when we really went. Can, can we just turn down the light a little bit maybe so that... Thank you. Um, we went to Iceland in uh, 2006 uh, with our travel photo studio and with our intention of creating this book. Um, so our idea was we would meet people and we would ask them all about their stories and histories and we didn't really, really think about that it's quite hard to meet people in Iceland, not because they don't want to meet you but because there aren't so many. And um, we then had to figure out, so where, where, where are they? There are no cafes and no open restaurants. And um, so we went to um, schools and t gas stations and tried to get in touch with people there. And this little girl, for example, Tina Sol, we saw at a gas station. We thought, oh, it's perfect. You would really like to photograph her. And um, it's a really nice story because it kind of explains a little bit about our how you can come to a country and, and trying to uh, want to do a project. But then it really depends on what you get back from the people, of course. And so we see Tina still in the gas station and we ask if we could photograph her or speak to her parents. And she was there with her dad. He was in the car outside and he said, yeah, sure, you can just call her mom. And we called her and explained a little bit about the project. And she's like, yeah, sure, you can photograph her. Just pick her up tomorrow and then you can drop her off at the gas station again, and you're dumb. <laughs> and we were really surprised by the trust and complete, yeah, trust in, in, in us. We haven't even met her mom. And um, this is kind of wonderful to see that this method that we so blindly kind of set out to use uh, has worked so far. 
This is a, um, we're, gonna, we're sort of using the Iceland to kind of explain our project a little. This idea also of, um, Nina and I were not at all interested in documentary photography. It was not about the 30th of a second, the moment. We were very much more interested in trying to create a more holistic image of what we saw, because as we were there, we were interviewing, gathering stories, and we were photographing, but we didn't know how they were gonna connect yet at this time in 2005. Uh, here's an example of uh, Isa in her grandmother's dress. When we met Isa, she was wearing you know, North Face parka, and indicative of just the cold winter there in Iceland. And we asked to photograph her. She was very nervous, very camera shy. And instead, we asked her if she could find something, a memory garment from her past that she could wear uh, for this portrait that we were going to do of her. So we, it took us about a half a day driving three hours and coming back and returning with her grandmother's dress. And we're very interested in the idea of um, how the memory of clothing or certain um, charms or trinkets in your life can also be tied in who you are today. Isa stood before us feeling that she was being someone else, but in the end, she was very much a portrait of herself. And I think it's one, just an idea of how to get people comfortable in front of the camera, but it also has many levels. And I think this sort of many levels is something that we keep researching forward in our, in our work. Um. And uh, this, this is one of the, another thing is we always tend to have self-portraits uh, within our project because as much as we're going somewhere else to discover something, I think there's also what happens to us on the way. Um, we had a car accident when we were in Iceland and this was an image that came out of that, this sort of the moment when time turns still and things become distorted, literally. And I think that was when we were really taking photography and, and breaking it apart and not worrying about the documentary image. Yeah, after we did Iceland, it actually became a book and it became also an exhibition later on. We wanted to try to continue that concept that had worked, a method that had worked in Iceland. And uh, uh, we decided we wanted to go somewhere where we actually would not know so much about yet. Iceland, everybody has, you know things about Iceland and, and you have a little bit of preconceptions, of course, about the place. So we um, decided we wanted to go somewhere where we possibly knew really almost nothing about uh, and not researching too much in the begin uh, in before we traveled either so we went to kyrgyzstan uh, an ex soviet union uh, country uh, it's uh, west of china and on the south of kazakhstan it's a quite small country um, a fantastic scenery and landscape two-thirds of the country are over seven thousand meters uh, and it's quite an interesting blend of different uh, elements, you can say. First is, of course, the landscape and the culture and the beauty of nature. It's also been Muslimic uh, and nomad, as, or it is Muslimic and it's been a nomadic uh, country. Uh, and then also the elements of the ex Soviet Union and how that comes in and, and this blend of things. Maybe I'm Muslimic, but they drink lots of vodka, for example, at least where we were in the north. Um, so we went there and we actually stayed with families um, during four weeks. Uh, and tried to also basically tell us a story and tell us a little bit about uh, not even your cultural history, but more uh, what kind of stories that were you told by your grandparents. In Kyrgyzstan, what's interesting is you don't have to search so much because they're great storytellers. They even have a, uh, it's in their tradition, you can say they have a, the most respected man is the great storyteller, Manas Che, and they would award this title to, to different people every year. And um, so this, we thought, was perfect for, for, our, for our project and, and to try to uh, develop the, the concept. Here also we looked at, uh, since we le uh, lived with families there, we, had, we looked at their photo albums and, and it reminded us a lot of what we, our first inspiration and fascination with the imagery. So I think with, um, when we were in, in Kyrgyzstan, like Nina said, it was just overloads of fantastic stories. Um, and amongst them is not just the sort of, um, you could say, these great myth uh, mythologies or historical fictions or wonderful tales. There was also the actual reality of the people that we were meeting when we were there. And 
just to tell you a little bit about uh, Shola, Shola is one of a major, you could say, one of the most interesting persons story-wise and person-wise that we met during the time that we were in Kyrgyzstan. I think it's specifically because of she was, became a, an inherent symbol of what we experienced there. Um, she was kidnapped when she was 21 years old, going to the university in Bishkek uh, studying mathematics. Kidnapping is um, a tradition from the old times in Kyrgyzstan that during, under the Soviet Union was illegal. It's something that has come back and about 80% of the women that we met in Kyrgyzstan uh, had been kidnapped and not necessarily always out of brutality. It could have been just two people in love that didn't have enough money to get married. So there were all different levels of this sort of tradition coming back. Uh, Shola, however, had a quite a, a, a brutal experience of being kidnapped by someone she didn't know, a Stockholm Syndrome situation where she fell in love with her kidnapper. Of all the women he could have taken, he had taken me. She had uh, two children, and um, she ended up leaving him at the age of 32. She was one of the only women that we met that had actually left her husband. She was still actually married to him, I think, when we, when we met her about a year or two after. Um, she started to sort of tell us her story um, over a series of, of days when we stayed with her and her family. And during that time, we photographed Shola several times, and on each occasion, we chose a different character from her, their own um, oral history. And so we were working together also again with the clothing, her going and finding clothing from her parents, from her grandmother, embodying these different characters, and for us, transforming before our eyes into these characters. But in the end, you could say the different le levels of Shola. Um, and so we worked with her for, for several days doing this. Uh, in this instance, she's wearing um, an attire that's only suited to that of a married woman. It was very controversial for us to photograph her in that way. We had, she had to sort of shun herself from her family. And this sort of the, the dichotomy of things. Um, Shola also had to, at the time when she left her husband, had to choose only one of her children that she could take with her. And she ended up taking her son, Islam, with her, but she had to leave her daughter. And I think yeah, mm -hmm. this was sort of a, just one, one story of many that happened in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and, and here is also a little bit the, um, the way we like to work and where we think we, we, we get the most um, truth for us out of it. Uh, or the, an interesting and multi-layered picture of a country, is, a country. Because countries, I mean, it is complicated. It's not just you can go there and often what you see is not what you get or what you see is not the real uh, truth that lies behind either. So we are very, very manipulative in our imagery. We are very, very far away from documentary photography. And we are not even pretending. Uh, we stage a lot of, uh, uh, we stage basically all our photo shoots together with the people that we work with, the people that we meet, to kind of reenact either parts of their life or parts of their greater cultural or bigger cultural history. Uh, so you can say they, they themselves reflect parts of their country's history. Um, this is an instance, for example, also where Sarah said before, she, that's Shola's son. Islam, and she had to leave one of her children behind. So we used one of the stories that we heard that uh, was a very famous story in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, it's called Evil Eye, and I'm just going to make that really short. But basically, it's about a pair of twins, uh, and they were so beautiful that the village was really uh, jealous about them, and they uh, put a spell on them, so they died really, really young. And Islam is starring in this story but he does not only, he doesn't only stand for the story, he as himself, he also stands for kind of like having to take the place of his sister. I think also in, in Kyrgyzstan, um, talking back to the way we work, sometimes it's a collaboration uh, with the people that we meet. And there's some moments that you have where you don't have to say anything. It's just there, right in front of you. This is an instance where we, we were about half, two weeks into our project and we were staying with a family in a village and it was the two daughters of the two sons. And we came into the home and we're having tea and the home had this sort of brown carpeting 
and then the walls had this matching tapestry, and on the couch was a tapestry matching the walls and the floor. And then the two women were wearing dresses made by their mother-in-law that matched the tapestries of the walls and the couch and the floor. And, the, and they just disappeared into this, this surrounding. And once again, we're always looking for that little bit of glitch or symbolism. And I think in that instance, we, we left it. And it became also part of other works that we did where we started having um, portraits of women where they were sort of disintegrating into the background and playing with this idea of being very much a symbol of the place where you are, the symbol of the home or this, this kind of metaphor that we were working with a lot uh, through the imagery where it was just as simple as a portrait but taking parts away. Um, speaking of an historical event that really had happened was a genocide in 1916 in Kyrgyzstan that was actually based to a lot of their epic tales that they would be telling. Uh, and uh, the genocide happened because uh, the Russian army came in to lucrate men for their war and the Kyrgyz didn't quite understand, of course, why they should fight. And there was um, not really an uproar, but the Russians killed a lot of uh, villages. Uh, the, the numbers differ a lot. Uh, on Kyrgyz side, they said up to two-thirds of the whole population of the northern part of Kyrgyzstan either fled or was killed at that time, in that year. Uh, and that was actually one of the first stories that we also tried to reenact in, in a way together with the school class uh, up in the mountains. Uh, and we, with that, together with them, we tried to um, have them reenact that event. And later on, not only um, kind of like reenacting the, the actual event, but also the stories that came out of that. There were a lot of stories coming out from just um, that horrible genocide that had happened. Um, one of the stories that you see here is a jar and the wolves. Uh, and it's told a little bit because it wasn't really allowed to talk about the genocide as a genocide uh, during the Soviet Union, but there were a lot of stories dealing with villages having been extinct and fleeing over to, the, to China over mountain passes. And here it's high mountains, it's 7,000 meter high, uh, or 5,000 meter high passes, 7,000 meter high mountains. Um, and that's really a lot of um, what we really, set out to do and wh where we, sorry, where we think it's very starting to be very interesting to take um, the stories of the people and having them reenact, um, having, having them reenact and collaborate with us. So uh, we're going to take you to another project and as you can notice here it's kind of unending. I mean we, we could just keep going and going and I think that's the idea. It's quite a process I, that we're that we're sort of discovering. And I think when we went to Kyrgyzstan, we had a method that we had developed that worked incredibly well in Kyrgyzstan because I think we were able to, we had a, were able to live with the families very intensely. Um, we ended up going to Qatar, uh, actually it was a commissioned work. Um, and in this case, it was, it was not quite like this. It wasn't this letting us into their homes. <laughs> Um, opportunity. It was not this uh, sitting down incredible oral stories and reenactment. It, it was a completely cloaked society. It was a very limited view. And us being women, I mean, we also, you could say, had our pluses and had some of, it was a very interesting way of like how you can relate and what doors are going to open and what doors remain shut. In Qatar, um, what was fascinating is I think we ended up analyzing it more on the levels of what is Qatar. And Qatar is a country that for 40 years ago was nomadic, um, sand, uh, say nomadic population, uh, pearl diving. Um, it was very much a place that is completely different from that of today with the uh, natural gas river reserves, third largest in the world. And it went from basically one type of cultural identity to another. 
about 20% of the population actually is Qatari and the rest is ex expatriates. So in that way, you're a min they themselves are a minority in their own country. Uh, and so when we were sort of investigating how to, to deal with this, um, we were much, much more looking at like what makes um, memory in a place like this that is constantly changing and in flux. The moment that there is um, a street corner that has some sort of significance, it's completely ripped down and built anew in the glory of sort of the new architecture and technology. So if place no longer holds memory anymore, then what, what does hold it? And we went into this sort of investigation of the different levels of Qatar and that of the Qatari people themselves and the stories of the old. We were working a lot with students and younger people, which actually didn't have much of the memory of before and only had it through the, the, or the traditions of the parents. There was also the other side of the expatriates coming in from Yemen, uh, from Egypt, um, all over the Middle East, and them also not only having, not necessarily having their place in Qatar, but only living off of the memories of places from somewhere else. So for us, it was very, very interesting to work in a place where it's opposite to Kyrgyzstan, uh, where they all had this shared collective memory. Everybody knew the same stories. Uh, to Qatar, where it's not like that at all. There is not a collective memory because it's people from all over, like Sarah said, the Middle East and also the Far East living in this one place together. And uh, so they all bring their memories uh, and cultural histories from, uh, from other places. Um, this, for example, uh, is a picture about a girl from Palestine. She has never been to Palestine. She grew up, was born and grew up in Qatar. She can also not go back to Palestine, but her home is Palestine. And she refers to Palestine as her home. And she tells the story of her grandmother sitting in Acre under a little tree on the hill. And she would go back in her thoughts as kind of this solitude place that uh, she refers to at home, uh, as home. So for us, it's been very, 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 very interesting to work with so many different memories from different cultures, uh, and they all come together to this one place. We will be very interesting also how that would, will evolve. And um, it was an, a challenge also, of course, like just doing the pictures about places like here in Yemen that we also haven't been to. So we had people draw from their memory what they imagined it to be. Um, and you can say this is, also, this is also very much how we work with people. We, we create the images out of what we get from, from the people's stories and what they can, what they can um, add to it through items or clothing items that they can bring from their families or through drawings. And I think in sort of summing things up in relation to now cultural heritage, and how much that is tied to your identity today. Um, this idea of looking at zeitgeist and how you can relate to that to then figuring out how it relates to us today. I would say Nina and I, or at least I can speak freely for myself, I mean, and why, why Nina and I are doing this, I think that I, I had this need of trying to understand where I come from and trying more to see the similarities and things, because we just took you to Kyrgyzstan, we took you to Iceland, we took you to Qatar, you know, I mean, very different places. But I have to say there was this red thread throughout it. We use, at the moment, stories as our um, ligaments to tie it all together. It's an ongoing process for us. I mean, I'm not sure that this, in 10 years, the same lecture that we're giving now will be so inherent in stories. Maybe there will be something else that we're tying things together or analyzing. But at the moment, it's something that we are, that Nina and I have burned for, that we use that in order to get to the bottom of things or to understand or discover something about ourselves in relation to. And just the fact that we're all here today and there's a conference or de dealing with this issue of cultural heritage probably says something about our time and where we are at this moment. I think that uh, 
we did it in <laughs> 30 yeah. minutes. <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> so nervous about uh, not being able to make it in the time and now we have lots of time <laughs> if you would like to ask any questions. Sort of made me nervous. I wasn't even here when you yeah, <laughs> finished. Exactly. That. I was there fascinated <laughs> by uh, the beautiful uh, photographs and pictures. It, it, um, it makes me think of, of paintings really, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them. Is that something that you have reflected on when, when you created these pictures? Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, yes, we are definitely influenced by pa or inspired by paintings, but also we, we didn't really start out at f as photographers either. So we never considered us as photographers, more as image makers or cap captivators, if mm -hmm. you can say so. So um, for us, the photography wasn't wholly in that way. So we... So you could have worked with any technique, really. Pardon? You could have worked with any technique yeah, it was really to create that we these images. Yeah, we photography. I think we felt the most comfortable in, and yeah. it's a very fantastic media to capture really something that's there. Mm -hmm. But then it doesn't give us this multi-layered technique that we want to, because it's more like a condensed impression of, or you can say, it, condensed impression of the moment that we want to deliver. And sometimes pictures in our mind or mm -hmm. photographs in our mind, they don't live up to that. How, how much did you discuss with, with the people what you were actually doing and what you were going to use it for? And, and, and did they contrib contribute a lot in, in the ideas that created the images in the end? Um, sometimes a lot, actually. I yeah. mean, we always had some sort of a pre-discussion of what our intention is. And um, if we had had a, like in the instance when we went to Kyrgyzstan, we had the book that we had done before and we had our guide who who explained to them in so many words what we were working with and we were artists and we were looking at trying to reenact their histories. Mm. Um, sometimes we, like in Qatar, um, when we were trying to figure out the memory maps, we had them doing drawings. Uh, so, um, you could call them cognitive drawings. It's where you're um, not just drawing, it's, it's not just drawing what's actually there, but drawing more a sort of, uh, how you perceive how things, you perceive yeah. things, or more holistic view, and we were using that um, to help us figure out how we could work it into our image. Uh, sometimes literally working it into our image, and other times maybe more um, in in mind and thought. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, quite a lot. I mean, it, it's a it's a huge discussion. I mean, you can't force anybody to do something that they don't want to do, and I think also it has to feel natural. Uh, at the moment that we're doing the image. Mm. Uh, I mean, it, it's a lot of give and take um, in this comfort zone. Mm. I mean, I am very camera shy, so I think I, I have a deep respect for when someone is, is not. Mm. Yeah. And you can tell when it's not. Have you, have you had a clear vision all along the way what the next step would be in your mm. image making? Or does that just happen? Well, <laughs> you can say it's not a linear process. Mm. We, we don't go there with knowing exactly what we're going to end up with or even do because our travels are not super pre-planned uh, and we're very open to the moment, very open to what happens to us, who we're going to meet, where we're going to come in. And sometimes we even do an image or take pictures of a person that then will actually become uh, a character in a story that we hear after. So it's a very kind of holistic pro process or project in the end where, where you, you don't go the linear way. So we have to wait until we have all the material to then kind of break it down to a project. So if I ask you what you're going to do next, you, you have no answer. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we definitely have our plans, but what, yeah. what, what it will mean or what will what it will look like or what's the story. The overall purpose is not there. No, like, I mean, a really good example is Iceland. We went there not knowing at all what we were going to get. And we ended up getting, everyone told us stories about murders mm -hmm. um, and how, you know, we, these villages of some sort of a wrongdoing or someone who had died in the town that then had become a ghost. So you could say it was, a ghost story project, but that was not exactly our, we were not there to get a ghost story project, but that's what came to us. So I think it's, it's what people want to tell at the time you meet them, what's on their chest, you could yeah. say, is what the project The images becomes. certainly tell a lot of stories. And, 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 I mean, you, it leaves a lot to, to imagination, despite the fact that 
there are a lot of details <laughs> <laughs> in them. I wonder whether we have qu questions or comments from the audience. Do you know? Uh, yeah, one or two? Very nice, because we have time. Oh, you want me to read this without my glasses? Also oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> This is more like a comment from uh, one person here. It's, uh, there is such beauty in your art. You have captured the soul of the place, the landscape and the people, history, the mythology, the light and the sun, as well as from the glow of fire, pure magic. I'm deeply moved. So it's Thank a you. Yeah. Maybe we can give you a hand for that. It was almost <laughs> like a poem. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was that was uh, hmm? that's all well, you need, really, yeah. wasn't it? It's, <laughs> it's wonderful to hear also because we've been discussing just in the car down to hear that we have gotten comments that are compliments like that, and it's really fantastic for us, of course, with our work to touch people. And we're always thinking, how is it that you that people are touched by so like cul a, if it just look on the first sight, maybe a culture looked a foreign culture. And we, we then, when we discussed it also, we feel that there is anyways, there are so many similarities between the cultures and kind of like the human element that comes in. Mm. We're always trying to, with our images, to kind of uh, create some kind of resonance with the people looking at it so they can, and, and the, like you, you said, space for imagination, the yeah. empty space, at the same time where you, where you give a lot of information. Have well. you been able to show the, 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 uh, the completed works, for example, for the individuals and the people in Kyrgyzstan? Uh, Kyrgyzstan, we've, we've sent some books back. Yeah. Um, what were their reactions? Oh, no, that's me. They no, love no. <laughs> their own pictures. See, there's a part, I don't know if you remember, there was an image with uh, photographs of their photo albums. Mm -hmm. They love that. They yeah. love seeing <laughs> their pictures actualized, printed, printed in a book and sent back to them. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed Thank you. for a most Thank you. inspiring lecture. Thank you.